not too scripted. Good evening and welcome again to Ideas of Work and Beyond. You know, a lot of times at the beginning of the show, I just take some time to talk about something that's sort of heavy on my heart. And, and this week, it was an email that I received. I attend Walnut Hill Community Church, um, and uh, I'll just read the following email. You wouldn't think that martyrdom is going on in this day and age, but what's happening right now in Nigeria is really heart-wrenching. Bear with me as I read this email. It says, Dear friends, I have hesitated to send this email. I haven't wanted to speak too soon to cause unnecessary anxiety or pass along wrong information. However, I received a text and a, and a call from a friend in Jos, J-O-S, Nigeria. Just now there are rumors of a battle descending upon the city. It's currently about midnight here. Nighttime is the most vulnerable time. This was sent on March 9th. The leader of our care center are keeping watch. Our center in the village of Jero, G-Y-E-R-O, is most vulnerable, as we have a hundred children there. The email below is from a reverend I do not know personally, but I've received it as a reliable source. He is describing the carnage that the news briefly covered on the attacks on Sunday, and he saw the aftermath with, with his own eyes. My heart is so heavy. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against evil, evil forces in the world. In that case, he's quoting Ephesians 6.12. With this in mind, be alert and always keep in prayer for all the saints. Ephesians 6.18 And then this is the eyewitness report from one of these missionaries in Nigeria. And, and it's a little heavy. <clears throat> Greetings in the precious name of the Lord. I write to request for special prayers over the Christians in Jos. Again, this is in Nigeria. This morning, 2 a.m. Nigerian time, we were awakened by the sounds of gunshot. Muslim insurgents and terrorists from the neighboring state of Bashi invaded some villages in the Bakaran Ladi local government area. One of the villages is called Dago Nahawa, which is about seven kilometers from where I'm living. After their visitation, more than 100 people were killed, most of whom were women and children, and seven, several th uh, thousands were injured. <coughs> This is a clear case of genocide against Christians in Jos. I thought what happened in January was the worst scene I'd, I'd ever witnessed, but this recent one is worse than that. I don't think I have the right object, uh, I don't have the right adjectives to describe the massacre. Some of the bodies we saw had their heads dismembered, while many of, many of them had their limbs chopped off. We also saw women with ripped stomachs and small children with skulls shattered as in bodies mutilated with knives and daggers. The invaders had many hours to themselves, therefore they systematically ransacked nearly all the compounds in the village. They killed and maimed anyone they came across. Since it, since it was in a remote part of the town, before security men could get there, they had done their worst and fled. The actual scope and level of the destruction is yet to be ascertained. What I can say is that it was well beyond my imagination. All the churches in the village were burnt. Governments say there was a mass burial of victims tomorrow. Brethren, it is with deep distress, with nowhere, I am in deep distress with nowhere to go. I fear for our lives, and I am writing this while I'm writing this email. My wife, who teaches in one of the local schools here, has not been able to go back to the schools for fear for her life. Jos is truly under siege by Muslim insurgents and terrorists. Please tell our brethren to continue to pray. We look only to God for a miracle and guidance in this very difficult time. The situation is demoralizing. We are now confused, very confused. And then he ends it with, Greater is he that is, me, is in me than he that is in the world. I'm sorry to have to start the show on such a low note, but I felt compelled to at least share in this small way, in this small television show, with what's going on in Nigeria right now, and this massacre, this genocide that's taking place. Now I realize that man in humanity toward man, towards another man is not limited to just Muslims, but in this case it's Muslim terrorism on a Christian community. I was thinking about this some. I had gone to Africa before and they talked a little bit about World War II and man in Inhumanity to his fellow man, you need only look at, 
at some of the atrocities of World War II to realize that it isn't limited just to Muslim atrocities. But in this case in Nigeria, that's what's going on. And I don't think that the world is focusing on it. So when I saw that email, I thought I was going to start the show with that testimony from the front lines in Nigeria and what's going on there. So be aware. It's, uh, it's still a very unsafe world. I am delighted uh, this evening to have Sam Caligari joining us. Sam, I apologize ahead of time for starting with that kind of heavy no, email. No, it's uh, um, but it, uh, it, I didn't know. I don't know how to transition to well, you uh, know what? Campaign. I was thinking about it, Marty. First mm -hmm. of all, thank you for having me on the no, show. It's delighted a, to have I'm you. I'm very, very happy to be here. Mm -hmm. It made me so profoundly um, appreciative to be an American and yeah. uh, and to, you know, I think we take for granted sometimes the civility and peace within which we live in this great American society of ours regardless of your religious views um, and the differences that we may have and we're so blessed and fortunate to be able to live in this great country yeah it's true I had uh, my wife and I went over to Mozambique and to South Africa this was about three or four years ago and just the freedom to be able to pick up the phone and dial 91 or dial 41 or 911 and realize that the police are going to come yeah. and that you can be defended, yeah. that you're not out there in some sort of a lawless community. Yeah. And really, in, in Africa, I mean, there's so much to, you know, there's so many uh, resources and, and blessings. The people, they're, they're, they're really wonderful yeah. people. Yeah. But the lack of security and the lawlessness is just, uh, is just devastating. I know. Well, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about campaigns and politics tonight. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's kind and, of a tough and, transition. Well, no, but. but you know, I mean, you know, here we are in a country and in a state where we can have serious political disagreements with yeah. one another and yet do it peacefully and in a civil manner. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and we're really very fortunate for that. And I think it's so easy for us as Americans, given the great blessings we have as a country, mm -hmm. to, to forget how lucky we really are mm -hmm. and how devastating conditions can be in other parts of the world yeah. at the very time that we're living under the, some of the greatest conditions in the world. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, I think we need to hear things like that every yeah. once in a while to be reminded. Yeah, when I, when I read that, I, I just felt like, what, what can I do? What can yeah. I do on this? I wanted yeah. to at least uh, open the show. Well, just that. raising awareness. Yeah. Ra raising awareness could be a step in the right direction. Yeah, and this is going on in Nigeria, and it's, uh, it's really affecting people. Okay. Transition now. You are running, and by the way, the, the number here is 792-4101. Feel free to call in um, and uh, you know give us your best shot, any answers. When we were talking about the show, I was talking with your lovely assistant about it, and I said, there really are no ground rules, um, and uh, people can call in with any questions they sure. have or anything like That's that. That's great. We'd like to throw a lot of questions at you. I do feel like, without hyping this too much, yeah. I think sometimes... Well, I, can, I accuse my wife of this because she'll be watching Fox News and listening to, you know, Rush Limbaugh, and she'll get all hyped like the world is coming to an end. And and I have to say, you know, just, you know, honey, relax. You know, it's going to be okay. <clears throat> but I really, really think that the United States is at a crossroads. And I really think the congressional yeah. seat that you're seeking, which is yeah. the fifth congressional seat, you'll be running against Chris Murphy, yeah. assuming you're the Republican, which I think I think looks pretty good, but yeah. that, that's yet to be seen. Um, I really think we're at a turning point in our country in what direction we're going to go. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and, and the debate over health care is just a small example of that with huge ramifications. Mm -hmm. I think right now Washington is being controlled by people who are deeply ideological and have a very definite left-wing agenda that they believe in with all their hearts. Mm -hmm. And it almost doesn't matter what the rest of America thinks is right. Mm -hmm. That pragmatism and compromise doesn't seem to be anything that they're interested. They're so convinced they have the right answer. Mm -hmm. They're going to push for it no matter what. And I believe that the leadership in Congress right now is of that mindset. And what that means is that we've got a Congress and Chris Murphy is part of that Congress mm -hmm. and he's part of this mindset that they know better than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And I think they're ignoring what most Americans and most people in Connecticut and in the 5th District are saying mm -hmm. because they're sure they're right. Mm -hmm. But that's an ideological approach. It's not an 
approach that seeks consensus. It's not an approach that really pays close attention to what people are saying because they're obviously ignoring it or else they wouldn't be rushing full steam ahead. Murphy is a prime example. Uh -huh. You know, even after the tremendous repudiation the American people have given to the public option health care plan, right. he went to New Haven a few weeks ago. He was quoted in a New Haven newspaper as speaking to a group down there saying we needed to work even harder to push for public option. Wow. So he's completely <laughs> ignoring what the people want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, he's right to have his ideals, but to do it to the point where he's ignoring what I believe the majority of people in this district wants, mm -hmm. I believe is representative of the problem in Washington right now. Mm -hmm. So we are at a crossroads. We yeah. are at a crossroads. And we're either going to go very hard to the left or we're going to recorrect and go more towards the middle, yeah. it, which is where I think a majority of people want to be. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, uh, my representative, um, is Jim Heim. Sure. And I, apparently he's a Rhodes Scholar, or so they say, <clears throat> which is fine. I'm sure he's a very well educated guy. I'm sure he made a lot of money on Wall Street, and I'm sure he's a fine fellow. But for a Rhodes Scholar to not recognize the voice of the people as reflected in the election in New Jersey, in Virginia, right. and then finally in doggone Massachusetts, where Ted Kennedy's seat was taken over by a guy who, uh, Scott Brown, who at every campaign stop said, I will be the 41st vote against this socialized medicine. Right. Right. And, that, and he, he, he was voted in, in Massachusetts. So, I mean, what, I mean, Chris Murphy seems like a smart guy. He is. What exactly is he thinking continuing to want to push for this health care program that it seems like the vast majority are against? Well, I think, number one, he actually believes it's the right answer. And that's why in this campaign we could have a real issues-oriented campaign. But number two... He's more interested in being Nancy oh, yeah. Pelosi's congressman than he is in being our congressman. Yeah. You know, he agrees with Nancy Pelosi over 98% of the time. He's not exercising his own mind. He's basically just doing what Nancy Pelosi wants him to do. Uh, uh, Caller, you're on the air. Hey, uh, Sam, hi. My name's Larry. I'm calling from Danbury. Hey, Larry. Nice uh, to talk to you. He's my uh, representative, and I'm sure I'll be considering you come November. Here's my question. Uh, you made some points about ideologues in Washington and how they're really not receptive to the will of the people. And certainly I understand that about the Obama administration. Uh, however, I can recall Dick Cheney being interviewed. I forget who it was. Uh, and he was at, you know, most of the, uh, and this is when he was still vice president, most Americans are against the war in Iraq. And his response was, so. And I, I guess my question is, do you think I, ideologues is just being when a party is in power, that being an ideologue is somewhat endemic to the process, or do you think it's um, you know just a one-party issue between Democrats and Republicans, and how will you help break the ideological logjam? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's Good a question. great question. That's, thank that, you. Thank you. That's, Larry, that's a great, great question because sometimes uh, I think, and you, what your question points out is a lot of times it's in the eyes of the beholder. Mm -hmm. um, and one person's ideology is someone else's uh, worst thing in the world. Right, right, right. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to seek balance, Larry. And I think, you know, when you believe you're doing what's right, you've got to forge ahead and do it. Um, but I think the point is, we have to try to be responsive as a government to what the people are telling us to do. If you believe that you're right on the issues, even if a majority of people disagree, I think you have a duty to forge ahead. But the, the price for that is that the people have every right to say, because we disagree with you, we're going to throw you out of office. And arguably, Larry, that's exactly what happened in 2006 and again in 2008. So when you're in power, you have the burden and the right to go ahead and do what you think is right. But when people disagree with you, and if they disagree with you on a massive level, you get cleaned out of office the way people did in 2006 mm -hmm. and with the kind of change we saw in 2008. And so my, my goal, Larry, is to always do what I believe is right in a way that's sensitive to what people in my district are telling me um, and to try to strike the balance on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. But I think you've got to keep an open mind, and I think that's the key. And if you look at my record as a state senator, if you look at my service as acting mayor of Waterbury and on the board of aldermen in Waterbury, mm -hmm. I've been able to get things done because I've worked consistently with Republicans and Democrats. In fact, I've, I've gotten two major pieces of legislation passed in Hartford as a member of the minority party, as a freshman and as a sophomore, because I was able to work in collaboration with Democrats. 
That's the kind of bipartisanship that has allowed me to get things done. And that's the sort of independence and bipartisanship that I want to bring to Washington. When people take a look at my record, they'll see I've not been afraid to disagree, even with my own Republican Party. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the only senator in 2007 to vote against the 2007 state budget because I believed it was wrong for Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I did that even though a governor of my own party supported it. Mm -hmm. So... What people really want is not someone they're going to agree with all the time, but someone who they believe is doing what they think is right and not just following the party line. Mm -hmm. And I think Murphy is an example of someone who's following the party line without regard to what the rest of us are saying is the right thing to do. Uh, uh, Larry, are you in favor of, uh, of this health care bill that's being proposed right now? Well, well Marty, I, I guess you have to look at it. You know, there's the Senate bill, uh, which I think... Uh, you know, eliminate the public options. Then there's the bill, um, which had you know, which had passed the House. So again, you have to really differentiate between the uh, between the two. Um, I think what's more likely to happen is that the Senate bill is ultimately going to be the one which is going to be considered. And you know, comparing that versus no bill, I would have to say yes. I would be in favor of it. All right. Well, thanks a lot for calling. Appreciate the call. Okay, Sam, I just want you to know I'll certainly consider you come November. Thank, Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I mean, he, he brings up, I mean, it's, it's kind of like this profile and courage, yeah. you know. Um, uh, hey, I'm going to get shot down in flames, but I'm doing the right thing. Um, I don't know. I see, I see this health care bill as, as such a overwhelming lurch to the left. Yeah. Um, when they're talking about adding an entire department in the IRS to collect the revenues from people, yeah. talking about uh, um, fines and jail terms if you don't pay into this health care program, um, when it talks about uh, just tonight, I just watching the news tonight that it, it said to to help out seven percent of the people that may not have sufficient health insurance. 93% of the public that generally speaking is pleased with their health is going to or their health care is going to see their either their premiums go up or certainly see their taxes, taxes go up. up. I saw the same report that joint tax commission came yeah. out with that study. I saw yeah. that. Yeah. And then and then I mean, you know, it, it's almost <clears throat> <laughs> it, it, this is almost like uh, John Kerry talking about uh, I voted for the war before Probably I voted against it. I mean, this quote, and, and I didn't believe the quote when I first heard it, but I went on YouTube and I saw her give this quote. We're talking about um, uh, Speaker Pelosi. She says, uh, but we have to pass the bill so that we can find out what's in it away from the fog of the controversy. So, I mean, <laughs> she literally said that. She, I, I, I copied down on the little backdrop she had where she was giving a speech. She was giving a speech to the National Association of Counties, yeah. I guess, National Association of County Governments. But she actually said, we have to pass the bill so we can find out what's in it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that, 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 is, that is unbelievable. That is exactly what she said. Yeah. And, and the idea is, well, if you disagree with this, if you don't, if you don't think this is uh, such a, a wonderful thing, then, you know, you just haven't read it or you don't yeah. understand. And you'll see, trust us. Or, or you're being a big-time partisan or something like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, um, I'm dead set against this. Yeah. Uh, my my uh, wife is Canadian. Um, she comes from a family of uh, uh, seven kids. We've got four brother-in-laws. Boy, did the... Phones go, phone lines go up when the U.S. was playing uh, the oh, Canadians I bet in hockey. In hockey. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I actually lost a bet. I had to sing the national anthem of Canada in a public place. It might be Times Square, but that's another story. <laughs> but How about I, here on the show tonight? <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> they don't give them any ideas. Right. They get to choose. <laughs> but uh, they, um, uh, but the Canadian healthcare system. We, I've had a front row seat to this, yeah. and it's not a pretty, pretty picture. Yeah. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, I had a mother-in-law who had a who had a tumor on her back, and and and, the, and, it, and it just grew and grew and grew until it was like about the size of a grapefruit, and and, and before she even had it treated. Um, another, I, I compared two shows ago. I just had a little knee surgery on my yeah. knee, had a little scoped and stuff. But I had a brother-in-law who's who's actually um, has cancer of the liver, mm. but he went to the doctor in November. They didn't they didn't tell him what they thought he had until January, and then he had to wait another six weeks to see a doctor. Yeah. So six months have gone by, and it's a it's a you know a, a very active cancer of the liver. Yeah. So 
be careful what you hope for with this socialized oh, yeah. medicine. Um, I remember mean, when you had the premier of uh, of um, Newfoundland who needs heart surgery or something, and he comes down comes to here. America. Yeah. And what about the great Canadian health care? Yeah. Well, he had the money, so he came here. But You know, I, there are things we can do to improve our system. Yeah. But what they're proposing right now is dead wrong. Yeah. We can increase access. We can help to control costs. We can make it more affordable for people. But we can do it without having the government take it over. There's so much that wrong, that's wrong with that, Marty. Mm -hmm. Number one, we can't afford another entitlement. We can't afford the entitlements we already have. Mm -hmm. If we make health care a federal entitlement, which is what the public option will do, I think it'll bankrupt the federal budget. I mean, we're already wrong. trillions of dollars in debt. Here's the second thing that worries me, mm -hmm. and we've seen it here in the state. If the federal government becomes responsible, primarily responsible for right. financing our health care delivery system, I am convinced there will be rationing. Mm -hmm. There will be exactly the kind of rationing that you described occurred in Canada. Yeah. And the reason for that is because it's American taxpayers who are going to be paying the cost of that health care system mm -hmm. through our taxes. Mm -hmm. The government will never want to levy the taxes that they need to to keep up with the growing cost. Mm -hmm. And what that will force the government to do is to ration mm -hmm. and to make sure that they control costs by making it harder for you to access care. Mm -hmm. We see it to an extent in Connecticut with our Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. Our reimbursement rates in Connecticut are so low under our Medicaid program mm -hmm. that there are providers of health care under the system who are pulling out yeah. and saying we're not going to participate anymore because it doesn't make economic sense for us to do it. Yeah. There are hospitals in Waterbury, for example, Waterbury and St. Mary's, that were on the brink of merging because they have such high Medicaid populations yeah. and the reimbursement rate is so low that they can't make yeah. ends meet anymore. Yeah. Why would we ever want to put the federal government in charge of financing our health care delivery system when we know that that will be the consequence? Yeah. There's a better way to do it yeah and they can't they can't do, I mean the, the part I mean, you don't even need to speculate how it would work out you don't even need to say well geez let's give them a shot mega this isn't working no. it's real expensive let's let them try they're trying the, the portions that they do have are bankrupt Right. You know why do we want to give them, why do we want to give them more? I mean, and not only that, but when you begin to look at uh, the healthcare system in Britain and some of these other places, people aren't going into medicine. They can't even attract doctors. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's the it's an, an interesting sort of crossroads of a couple different issues. But if you remember um, that Jeep in the Glasgow airport, that that flaming Jeep, like two or three years ago, that that drove into the airport in some sort of vague, you know, uh, terrorist attack. And it turns out that it was it was doctors from the Middle East that were coming to, to Scotland, coming to, um, to to because there's a real need for doctors, and they were you know the, um, you know they turned into Muslim terrorists or whatever. But they were the ones that that that, that went in there. It's just kind of interesting. Hmm. Caller, are you there? Good, good, good. We'll put you on the air. Unfortunately, I can't be on your roundtable today because I'm doing behind-the-scenes stuff again here. Yes, this is Al <laughs> Robinson, the founder of uh, Hat City Blog, the man who wears a lot of hats here on the show. Yes, Al? Way too many hats today. Way and, too many hats. You can see me back here. I'm doing <laughs> a million things with two hands. It's crazy. <laughs> um, I, I'm, since I can't be on the roundtable today, I'm just going to ask a question from time to time. Uh, my first question is that, you know, you're running for the 5th Congressional District. You have a number of other candidates in there who are running as well. Uh, you have Justin Brenner. I might be pronouncing his last name wrong. Yeah, but you I'm not sure how to pronounce Mark it. Greenberg as well. And I know that you, before running for Congress, you were running for U.S. Senate. So um, my first question would be, if you're running for Congress right now, what 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 does what did, what made you decide to switch from running for U.S. Senate to running for Congress? That that's an excellent question. Yeah, we did have a bit of a musical chairs because then you yeah. had Foley who was running for Senate, Senate who and then now he, running now for he governor. went to governor. We had you, you that were running for. Senate, Senate, and then you went for um, Congress. Uh, Congress. Okay, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I ran for Senate because I believed we needed to get rid of Chris Dodd because Chris Dodd represented everything that went wrong with career politicians in Washington. Mm -hmm. It was time to get rid of him. He's wrong on the issues, and I believe he wasn't doing his job for the people of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I really felt very strongly that I was in the best position to beat Chris Dodd. Mm -hmm. So I got into that race almost a year ago now. Mm -hmm. um, I worked very hard at that race, but a number of other people got in. And over All time, it became clear that there were other people who were in a All better in. position than I was to be Chris Dodd. But at the same time, people were saying, you know, Sam, Chris Murphy is every bit as bad as Dodd. Mm -hmm. He is identical to Dodd on the issues. They're almost down the line the same. Mm -hmm. And it's only taken him three years to get to that point. You're in the best position to beat Murphy. You can do a tremendous service to Connecticut mm -hmm. by putting your attention on Murphy. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, for me, it's never been about holding any one particular office. Mm -hmm. I wasn't running for the Senate because I had a lifelong ambition to be a senator. I felt that we needed to get rid of Chris Dodd, and I could do a good job doing it, and I could do a better job for Connecticut than he was. Mm -hmm. But I could fight for all of the same issues in the House than I can in the Senate, and we need to get rid of Chris Murphy every bit as much as we need to get rid of Chris Dodd. Um, good point. Caller, you're on the air. Do you have a question for Sam? I do. Uh, Mr. Caligari, because you're so against uh, government taxpayer-funded health care, would you pledge tonight that if you go to Congress, would you turn down the benefit of, of taxpayer-funded health care like Representative Courtney does? Ooh, huh. good question. Do you have another question? I'd like to keep you on the line. I like these probing questions. No, that's the only question. Oh, well, it's a good question. Thank you very much for calling in. Okay. What about that? I mean, that ticks off yeah. a lot of people when they're talking about, well, we're going to have this new health care program, but, you know, we've got this gold-plated health care program yeah. for all the congressmen, and they don't opt out of that. They keep theirs, but, you know, the little people, uh -huh. we're going to put something together for no, you. No, you know Right I, now, I, yeah. public television, look into the camera and pledge <laughs> which, you're not Which camera? Well, what, are, what are that one right there? Well, I, I will I think that's a great question, and I think what we need to do is make sure members of Congress are treated the same as everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we ought to be, you know, we shouldn't have, and it's one of the reasons I'm such a supporter of term limits and trying to prevent careerism in politics, is I don't want someone feeding off the public trough at all, let alone for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that members of Congress should be treated exactly the same as every other American. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I would take a look at. And I need to make sure I know how I would get health care for my family because I'm the provider of my family. But that's mm -hmm. something I would certainly consider. Okay, so we have you nailed down to taking a look at it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, sorry, Carl. That's the best we can do. He's going to take a look at it. Um, you talk about term limits. You have sort of a compelling story. Um, I, I heard you once speak in a guy's backyard, actually, yeah. uh, in Ridgefield, but you talked about how you went in for some knee surgery, was it? Yeah. Right? Okay. What? And, and, he, and you woke up the mayor of Waterbury Just or something about. like that. Yeah. How, how did that work? That, exactly? It's an amazing and experience. And how does that tie into term limits? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's a great... It's a good question. Mm -hmm. I served on the board of aldermen in Waterbury for five years. I'm born and raised in Waterbury. In fact, I still live there. Mm -hmm. My state senate district includes Waterbury. Um, I had served on the board for five years, the last two of which as president. Mm -hmm. um, about a year before I ended my term, people came to me and asked me to run for mayor, and I said I wasn't going to run for mayor, and in fact, I wasn't running for re-election to the board of aldermen. Mm -hmm. And so by July of 2001, I was just six months away from the end of my term. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had torn a ligament in my left knee, Mm -hmm. uh, I left work on Tuesday. The plan was to have surgery on Wednesday morning, and I'd be back in my law office on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Well, as they were walking me into the operating room at Waterbury Hospital, the anesthesiologist who was standing at the head of the table said, oh, I just heard Phil Giordano got arrested. Now, Giordano was the mayor of Waterbury mm -hmm. at the time. I must have turned white as a ghost because in the meantime, the surgeon walks in and says, what's wrong? You look terrible. <laughs> and I said, well, I just heard Phil Giordano got arrested. And he said, well, so what? And I said, well, I think that means I'm the mayor of Waterbury, <laughs> honest to God, uh -huh. because I understood yeah. that the moment the mayor became incapacitated, by operation of charter, I automatically became the mayor. Oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. so the last thing I remember saying was tell my wife who's out in the waiting room to call City Hall and tell them where I am. Yeah. And I woke up from that surgery, the mayor of Waterbury, at a time when the city had been taken over by the state for fiscal mismanagement yeah. and where we had yet another mayor carted off on alleged corruption charges. Wow. And one of the first decisions I made was one of the best decisions I ever made mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons I'm such a strong believer in term limits. Mm -hmm. After I had power handed to me, 
people came to me and said, well, now you've got to run for mayor in your own right. Because this was right at the beginning of an election season. Yeah, you're an incumbent. And that, in effect, yeah, I had not, all of the power arrested. of incumbency. That's you're not behind bars yeah. and you're an incumbent. In Waterbury, that's good. It's, it's, it's saying something. That's, saying, but, yeah, that's good. And, and I made a decision not to run. Uh -huh. And it was one of the most important decisions I made because by taking the politics out of the mayor's office, mm -hmm. there was someone there who was doing something that someone there hadn't done in a very long time, mm -hmm. which to just focus on doing the job. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we got more done in the way of fiscal and ethics reform in the six months that I was the acting mayor hmm. and some of my predecessors had done in an entire two-year term. So you completely voluntarily put term limits and on myself on yourself. And what I have said is if I'm lucky enough to be elected to Congress, I'm mm -hmm. going to self-impose term limits on myself. Mm -hmm. I will serve four two-year terms mm -hmm. and I'm going to push for term limits legislation because mm -hmm. careerism in politics is a cancer. People go down with the best of intentions, mm -hmm. but the system sucks them into a process that makes their own re-election the most important thing in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start to lose your independence. That's how you end up siding with Nancy Pelosi over 98% of the time like Chris Murphy does, mm -hmm. because then when you do that, Nancy Pelosi comes into Connecticut and raises you tens of thousands of dollars like she just did a week ago. Yeah. You don't we, do we that unless have, you play that game. Some, we actually have some footage of that. Yeah. Um, which we're going to have towards the end of the show here is uh, Nancy Pelosi right here in town yeah. raising money for Chris Murphy. I mean, the, the, the choice in this situation could not be more stark. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you want, if you like what you have with Pelosi and Reid and the direction that the country is going and you think that, well, things are uh, frightening and scary right now, I want big brother government to come in and take care of everything, or well, that's what you're hoping, then I guess you, you you vote that way. But if you want you, if you want someone that has an idea for limited government that isn't looking for a career, you seem like a very prosperous attorney. Uh, would this be a pay cut for you to go into Congress? It, it so would be. Here's a guy that doesn't need the job, um, and uh, and and you know that's something to consider. You're not looking to make this a career. No. Um, I want to I want to get into yeah. two different things. Yeah. One, let, I want to talk about the economy in general, yeah. and I want to talk about let's just talk some brass tacks raw politics. Yeah. Because uh, a little birdie told me that you need to raise some more money, and that Chris Murphy has raised more money than you, and some of the incumbents <laughs> and things like that. I mean, uh, money is the mother's milk of politics. Have you found that difficult? Uh, are you, where, where are we at with all this? Is all publicly, well, you know? If I oh, was... absolutely. Well, first of all, I mean, of course Murphy's going to have more money. Mm -hmm. uh, but when Murphy beat Nancy Johnson, Nancy outraised him over two to one. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have yeah. the money we need to beat Chris Murphy. Uh, we've only been in this race for four months, and we've already gotten off to a huge start. In fact, in the four weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is when I was in the race, right. I raised as much in that four-week period as my nearest competitor for the nomination race for the entire quarter. So we got off to a really strong start. Okay. But that's going to be it's a regular part of this process. Okay. Do you have a website in case people like yeah. what they're hearing? What uh, might that website be? Samforcongress.com. Samforcongress.com. All right. Call, are you on there? Yeah, um, it's, it's me again, Mario. Oh, that's right. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not able to be on the round table, so i got to do these. So. You can come oh. on in here and be on the round table. Al Mendez, he made that point already before. Go ahead. Yeah, it seems nice. If I'm on the round table, we got nobody back there running the front of the there. <laughs> That'd be kind of strange. But There's a reason we had you back there, Al. Uh, you know, in, in watching these races that I've been watching for the last few cycles here, uh, two things come out, and especially this time of year, what type of money you have and your delegate counts going into the convention. Um, looking at your uh, your cash on hand, it shows you, you know, you, you have a little bit of a little bit of fundraising to do compared to, let's say, Justin or, let's say, compared to Greenberg. Um, you talked a little bit about money. I just want to find out, are you concerned about your money at this point and what we can do in terms of raising money forward? And number two, more importantly, again, because the conventions are coming up really soon, how are you doing in terms of delegate counts going into the convention? Are you, do you feel confident that you'll be able to get the nomination over Greenberg and over Justin? Thanks. Yeah, th those are good questions. I mean, that's, you know, round one is getting the nomination um, has a lot to do with fundraising and delegate count. How yeah. are you doing on that front? You know, I, we're doing great. I mean, like mm -hmm. I said, um, in the four weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we raised as much money as my nearest competitor did for the entire quarter. 
Mm -hmm. So that was a really strong start. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got a quarter that ends on March 31st. We'll be reporting our numbers by the middle of April. Mm -hmm. And um, all I can tell you at this point is that we're doing great. Mm -hmm. But the numbers will speak for themselves once they come out. Right. But uh, well, we're doing very well in terms of fundraising. And I think that's going to continue and get even stronger over time. In terms of delegates, you know, I, I don't want to presume um, to... Uh, to speak for any of those delegates, there are 300 people who will come to the convention on May 21st and make a decision. Uh -huh. But I will tell you that based on the Republican town committees that have supported me, uh, the town chairmen that have supported me, and where I see things going, I feel like I'm in an excellent position to win the nomination, and not just to win the nomination, but to hopefully prevent a primary. Mm -hmm. So that's your, that's your goal? You want to avoid a primary? At I want to win so overwhelmingly we avoid a primary. Okay. Because I, I think it's important for us to start focusing on Chris Murphy as early as possible. Okay. Um, all right. Just so, so you're doing good as far as, far as the raw politics. I, I think as far as the election, you have incredible name recognition in Waterbury. That seems to be the crown jewel of this district. So does that... You know, bust your, or, or improve well, it, your confidence. It, it helps. I mean, I, w I want to make it very clear. We need to win in all 41 towns in this district. And mm -hmm. so I'm running a 41 town strategy. But here's a historical fact, Marty. Mm -hmm. We have never in the last 30 years had a Republican congressman from the 5th district who hasn't been from Waterbury or New Britain. Okay. And the reason for that is because the Who Democrats. Who are we talking about? Like Gary Franks? We're talking about John Rowland, Gary Franks, okay. Nancy Johnson. Okay. When you, and, and that's combining the fifth and the sixth. Right, right, right. And so Nancy was from New Britain. Right. Roland and Franks were from Waterbury. Right. So if you go back over the last 30 years, the only times Republicans have won mm -hmm. is when they've been out of either New Britain or Waterbury. Right. And here's the reason for that. The Democrats run up such huge pluralities in the Democratic strongholds of Waterbury, New Britain, and Meriden, mm -hmm. that it's very hard for a Republican to make up that difference in the rest of the district. Yeah. And so when a Republican is able to neutralize a Democratic advantage in mm -hmm. one of those cities, usually Waterbury or New Britain, right. you take thousands of votes out of the Democrats' pocket. Yeah. Now, you can't just win Waterbury, which I believe I can do because I've done it repeatedly, mm -hmm. and win this election. I need to win in Danbury. Mm -hmm. I need to win in New Fairfield and in Newtown and in Sherman and in Litchfield and Salisbury mm -hmm. and Farmington. So it's a complete 41-town strategy. Right. But one of the reasons why I'm in such a strong position to get the Republican nomination is because Republican delegates and town committees understand mm -hmm. that I am the only person in this race who can win Waterbury. Mm -hmm. And from a Republican perspective, that dramatically changes the electoral map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you're in a, in a very strong position. I want to talk a little bit just about uh, the economy, because I think, I think, first of all, the Obama administration is making a huge mistake and continues to make a huge mistake by focusing on this health care issue, uh, you know, for whatever their motivation is. And I, and I hope it doesn't pass. But um, what people are, what is foremost on their mind is the economy yep. and jobs. Yeah. And, um, you know, I looked into this a little bit. Uh, the, uh, apparently, let's see if I got the numbers right. In the last hundred years, there have been 22 recessions uh, since they started sort of looking at this going all the way back into the 17 or like eight, late 1800s. There have been like 79. There have been ebbs and flows in the recession. I, there's a quote from Margaret Thatcher that I think sort of captures this. Um, it, it's talking about Margaret Thatcher and it says, um, that since its inception, capitalism has known slumps and recessions, bubbles and froths. No one has yet disinvented the business cycle, and probably no one will. Uh, what are called the gales of creative destruction still roar mightily from time to time. To lament these things is ultimately to lament the bracing blast of freedom itself. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's good. To, you know, the uh, lament, the bracing blast of freedom itself. Now, this is my question. Um, this recession is a real pisser. I mean, it, 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 it just bothers me to drive to the studio and see empty buildings yeah. and to see empty businesses. It bothers me when my, you know, my cousin was involved, he, he, he worked down on Wall Street He's out of a job. He hasn't been able to line something else up. It yeah. really bothers me. But at the same time, I see 
the the opposing party come in and say, you know what, government's going to come in, and if you just give us more in your tax money, we're going to take care of all this. We're going to make sure everything's fine. And they they run up the debt, and they have this ill-advised stimulus program that they send, and I don't think that it, it's affected jobs one bit. And the thought of freeing, I mean, when you have Ronald Reagan's approach, because he came into an economy that was in disaster as well, but his approach was, we're going to cut government. Taxes cut taxes, we're going to free the private in industry to, to work, and we eventually worked our way out of it, and the 1980s were really a, a great time, and oh, by the way, double the revenues to the federal government. You know, people are always talking about, let's raise taxes, thinking you get more revenues. That doesn't happen. More often than not, you raise taxes, you get less revenue right. coming in. Right. Reagan cut taxes dramatically and doubled the revenues to the government. So I guess my approach is philosophically, we have a government, we have a congressman from our district that's lockstep with this, which is going towards let's let big government start the printing presses and, and, yeah. and solve all these problems. Would your approach be more Reagan-esque, or I don't want to speak for well, you, it would be, it would be it would be very much so, because yeah. a couple of things. First of all, the, the Thatcher quote is very powerful, but we are not just going through a normal business cycle. Okay. We are going through one of the most painful economic periods we've known in modern American times. Uh -huh. And part of that is due to bad economic policies being pushed out of Washington. Mm -hmm. There were a number of things that Washington did as a matter of policy that I think made this recession far worse than it could otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. Then the other side of the coin is what can government be doing to help get us out? Now, the stimulus is not helping in the least mm -hmm. because growing the government isn't going to stimulate the economy in mm -hmm. any material way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the economy hasn't seen material growth and we've spent untold amount of money yeah, on this yeah. stimulus bill. The I'm last thing we need technology. is to do the same. Here's a much better way. To really grow this economy we have to do three things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. We have to start to control federal spending and cut it, which is why I'm a firm believer in spending caps. Mm -hmm. We have to reduce the federal debt and we have to engage in broad-based tax cuts. Mm -hmm. The only proven way of growing the economy quickly and in a sustained way is to take money and put it back into the economy. Mm -hmm. The quickest way to put money back into the economy is to cut taxes mm -hmm. on both corporations and individuals mm -hmm. so that money can then immediately flow back into the economy through the decisions that businesses make to reinvest and the decisions that individuals make mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, in terms of how to spend their money. Yeah. And that is the single best way to do it. And you are exactly right. I am a supply sider, mm -hmm. as Reagan was, right. because clearly the data shows that cutting taxes actually increases tax yeah. revenue. Yeah. And raising taxes show, lowers it. Yeah. Maryland instituted a Maryland tax, or a, a strike that, a mm -hmm. millionaire's tax, right. and they actually had less revenue yeah. and fewer people who were filers yeah. in the following year. Well, it was attributed to Abraham Lincoln, you cannot lift the wage earner up by bringing the wage payer down. Yeah, that's a and great I think quote. It really is. It's just kind of not, apocryphal. It might not have been him. It might have been a Methodist guy back there. But that, <laughs> it, it, if he didn't say it, he should have said it. And yeah. I think that that's true. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what they're missing. You, and, you know, if I could just put it as plainly as possible, we need to control federal spending and cut it where we can because yeah. we need to start getting the deficit under control. And the only way we're going to grow the economy is through broad-based tax cuts in both the corporate rate and the individual rate. Yeah. That's the recipe for turning this economy around. Yeah, and not only that, but what they're doing with all this you know, time messing around with this health care thing yeah. is it's freezing everyone. Well, Because they're looking at, you know, they're saying, well, am I going to hire a new guy? Well, am I going to have to pay his health care? Am I going to get taxed for this? If I don't, am I going to get fined? Yeah. What's going to happen? No one knows. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to do anything because it looks like a lot of chaos going on in Washington right now and none of it seems very business friendly. Well, I mean, that's part of it. The other part of it is all the time and attention that's being spent on pushing this public option health care plan mm -hmm. is time we're not spending in Washington trying to turn the economy around. Yeah. Now, here's the one point I'll make on this. Health care cost is a cost driver for American businesses, but there's a better way to control that than what's being proposed now. Mm -hmm. And I think if we did a refundable tax credit for businesses, especially small, small businesses yeah. for the cost of providing health care to their employees, mm -hmm. we can dramatically increase access and we can start to reduce the cost of businesses mm -hmm. and we can do it all without growing the size of government.
The last thing we need to do is that dastardly tort reform. Don't you agree? Those lawyers, they're the ones that are getting all... Well, as I'm long... <laughs> hey, we're, we're not all tra tra oh, created the same. Okay. Uh, but on tort reform, yeah. we, we need to do... Well, you would know. You we know, need, you to, know do, what you, you we know. need to do litigation reform. There's uh -huh. no question about it. But we have to be careful to do it in a way that doesn't make it harder for people who have been hurt to get redress from the system. Okay. Call are you there? Yeah, okay. Uh, Go ahead. You're on the air. It's Larry again. Um, two points, if I may. One about the economy. I also have a follow-on question to Sam's comment about term limits. If we can agree that there's a certain cost associated with government, then there's a certain level of taxation and governmental intervention, you know, that, that's appropriate. So I don't really think it's accurate to say, well, I'm from the government and I'm here to help and just give me <laughs> a lion's share of your money and, and things are going to go away. You know, you mentioned Ronald Reagan, but commencing with his presidency, he really led the reform towards deregulation in the country. And um, a lot of the financial issues, and, you know, Chris Dodd is certainly, uh, you, you know, a problem with it, you know, in the banking is in the banking area, in mortgages, in financial uh um, financial circles came from a deregulatory environment. So there, you know, I think more governmental regulation, you know, certainly would have been helpful to, you know, the country. And, and I think a lot of these, you know, credit default swap shenanigans, um, you know, collateralized, collateralized mortgage obligations, that also contributed greatly to the recession as opposed to just, you know, intrusive governmental policies. That's one comment, and then uh, just a question for Sam, and then I'll, I'll listen to your responses about term limits. He mentioned that when he was mayor of Waterbury, the first decision that he made was his best one, you know, that he wasn't going to run again and that allowed him to operate without political uh, uh, motivations. Uh, but the problem comparing a mayor of a city to being a representative of the United States is seniority. Seniority on committees, seniority in terms of you know, getting legislation passed. So if you were to impose a four-term limit on yourself, then wouldn't that not be dis being, would that not disadvantage the district by limiting, you know, the seniority that you'd be able to attain over your time in Congress? Great. That's a good question. Yeah, two this, this Larry is one smart cookie, I'll tell you. <laughs> Larry, um, thank you. Two great questions. Let me start with the second one first. Um, you know what? If eight years is good enough for the president, it ought to be good enough for members of Congress. And in my experience, I've been able to get major legislation passed as a freshman and a sophomore in the minority in the legislature, and I believe I could do the same thing as a member of Congress. Um, I will tell you, I disagree with your point on regulation. I don't think the lack of regulation is what created the problems uh, that resulted in our economic crisis today. I think it was bad policy being forced on Fannie and Freddie to write mortgages that their underwriters wouldn't otherwise have required them to write or allowed them to write. It was the change to the mark to mark market accounting rules mm -hmm. which forced institutions to on their books reduce the value of assets that were mm -hmm. per perfectly good assets. Those are two examples and, and that decision alone, those changes in the mark to market accounting rules made financial institutions that were actually strong appear weak and that precipitated their demise, Larry. And so those were not because of deregulation, those were because of bad policy decisions coming out of Washington. Well, what about repeal of Plastic? What about uh, the allowing banks to you know, really enhance the amount of leverage that they could use to, you know, enter into risky transactions. I, Both of those came about because of deregulation. Yes, and, that, and then that's part of it, but you can't blame it all on deregulation. No, no, I wasn't. I, I, was, just, I was just mentioning it. There's ebbs and flows. Yes. You know, deregulatory, you know, um, you know emphasis starting with Reagan, and, and Obama's come in, and he's, you know, now tilting, tilting the ship to the other side. So I, I, I think you have to find... Uh, a happy meeting. Yeah, it, it's about the balance, and that's what we have to look for in policy. And, and you raise a good point, Larry, and that's what I'm going to try to do. It's what I've always tried to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the call. We do have some footage from uh, Nancy Pelosi, who was in town here. Um, uh, Al, if we're ready, we can, we can roll that. If you're ready to go. Al's usually on. There. Um, my colleagues, oh, and, and the when I stand up. <laughs> Some of the uh, challenges wow. that you all so 
appropriately bring forth. First, let me just thank you all for what you do in the community uh, to make America healthier. We're all in your debt from that. And we learn from you on it because you're on the front line. And maybe if I could just put what we're trying to do in perspective. Think of it this way. I say to my, uh, to my colleagues and people, the most privileged person in America with all the wealth and opportunity and knowledge and access will have better health care if the poorest person in America has access to health care. If we're all in a common record, and that's why the technology of the electronic medical records is so important, teaching hospitals teach in places where they can learn from a wide array of, 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 of diagnoses and it benefits our entire health care system. Having access to the community health centers, which is a very important part of what we do, we have a large increase in funding in community health centers in the legislation because they have been a first line of defense in many cases for people to have access short of just going to an emergency room uh, when they have no, absolutely no other recourse. So we're thinking not to think that this is a trickle down thing, but to say the wave of the future comes from the people. Many more people treat it. Many more people healthier, much more prevention, as Dr. Missouri said, early intervention. So how we put this deal together was to say, how do we, again, I get a triple A rating, how do we improve access, increase affordability for many more people, especially in the middle class who might not fall into uh, some uh, subsidies or whatever, and hold the insurance company accountable. Left to their own devices, they have done great harm to the health of America. We thought, let me just put today, what's today, the 6th of March? Yesterday was the 6th, that's March. <laughs> March 5th of a year ago, I said yesterday I was making the speech of Boston, not this, but I was using these bookends. March 5th, 2009, President Barack Obama called a bipartisan meeting to the White House in the East Room. Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate. Stakeholders from out there, everybody, pharmaceutical industry, health insurance industry, community health centers, children's health uh, experts, women's health, you name it, every possible manifestation of health care and public policy was present in the room. The president reached out and said we want to work together in a bipartisan way to get this done. Senator Grassley stood up, the Republican leader, uh, ranking member from Iowa, and he said, he questioned the public option. President Obama said, public option, in my view, is the best way to hold the insurance companies accountable to increase competition and make it better for the consumer. If you have another way of doing it, put it on the table. The American people know what the doctor told them. If you're mandated to have health care, don't throw me to the wolves of the insurance company. Give me some other option. Well, as you know, the insurance company weighed in, and you know it locally, weighed in on this in a way that prevented 60 votes in the Senate from getting that public option. But we were determined that we would get as much as we could that a public option could achieve because it wasn't about the ideology of, an, of that particular tool. It was about what it would achieve for affordability, access, and um, holding the insurance companies accountable. We went to an idea that had been espoused by Republicans. The exchange. Olympia Snow is one of the co-sponsors of the uh, co-authors of legislation. Senator Enzi, or the ranking Republican on the Health Committee, that is the one of the committees that wrote the bill in the Senate, uh, found that. So for one year, now we have the book last week on that last Thursday when the president again called Democrats and Republicans together to talk about any ideas they might have to approve the, the, the legislation as it went forward. 
So let's just spell one of these things, that this has not been open to ideas. For the year in between, far too long in my view, that the Republicans have had their chance, or those who oppose health care have had their chance to put their ideas on the table on how they would serve the American people. What we saw then was that there weren't many ideas, but the president was still open and receptive, much more patient than some of us on that score, uh, to some ideas they had about improving the exchanges or removing more waste, fraud, and abuse, and uh, dealing with some issues. Actually, one good idea emerged. One good idea emerged from there. And, and something we had been fighting for, but it helped us, which was to make a, a Medicaid docs have primary care docs for Medicaid who pay the same as Medicare doctors. Right. And we were for that, but again, in the competition for the dollar, um, <coughs> there are decisions that were made that said we may have to wait for later for that, but now we will have some of that. We had some, and now we have a little more. <coughs> anyway, my whole point is this enough already with waiting for a, a, another view of the world. You are either for, and I think what emerged from last week's meeting was, you are either for regulating the insurance companies or you are not. Yeah. And you either for eliminate, uh, deny, eliminating the denial of coverage on the basis of pre-existing conditions, and you are not. That's the most obvious manifestation of reforming the insurance industry. Well, there was Nancy Pelosi. I'm not sure we got the quote where uh, she said, but we have to pass the bill so that we can find out what's in it, away from the fog of controversy. I'm not sure that's what uh, she said during that. Um, but uh, I just want to close with this uh, quote from Roman statesman, uh, uh, 106 B.C. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. The public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of officialdom should be tempered and controlled. The assistance to foreign lands should be cur curtailed lest we bankrupt ourselves. People must again learn to work in, instead of living off public assistance. My guest tonight has been Sam Caligari. He is running for the 5th Congressional District against uh, Chris Murphy who, if you liked what Nancy Pelosi had to say right there, then you'll want to vote for uh, Chris Murphy. If you think we need a change, you want to vote for um, uh, Sam Caligari. Sam, I want to give you the last word. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much, but Marty. But if, if you have a website or anything like sure. that, or you have the last 30 seconds to tell people what you want, go right Great. ahead. Marty, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I would love to earn uh, the votes of the people of this area who are watching the show and their friends and family. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more about my campaign, more about me, you can look us up at samforcongress.com. Our phone number's on there, our email's on them. I'd be happy to answer questions that people have if they want to reach out to us directly. But I want to go down to Washington to fight for two things. We need to fix the system in Washington, and we need to bring fiscal responsibility back to Washington. We're going to fix the system through term limits, banning earmarks, and campaign finance reform, which will radically improve the system in Washington. And we're going to fight for a stronger economy by balancing the federal budget and cutting taxes. Those are the, those are the things that I want to fight for so we can make government more responsive for people in the 5th Congressional District, and I would love to earn the people's vote. Sam Caligari, he's running for Congress. Thanks for joining us. Uh, join us again next week when we'll have someone here. Uh, David Strait will be joining us, and then the uh, Ridgefield Visiting Nurses Association will be in as well. So join us again on Ideas of Work and Beyond, and have a good night. Thanks.